Thank you for joining me today. Uh, we're going to be talking about human-centered design um, from not exactly a beginner's perspective, but from the perspective of someone who has maybe heard the term, uh, but maybe doesn't know exactly what it means. Um, and my goal today is to get you oriented about what it means um, so that you can build on that and get started right away making better websites for your audiences. Uh, but first, uh, my name is Colin Panetta. I'm the director of UX UI at Last Call Media, where I've been designing for the web for 14 years. We do a lot of work for government and also higher ed and nonprofit. Uh, we like to do work with purpose, as we say. Um, if after our session today you have any further questions, you can drop me a line over email or on LinkedIn, or feel free to flag me down here at the event. Uh, I'd love to talk. So uh, human-centered design, maybe you've heard of it because it's been a pretty big buzzword in government for a few years now. Um, because of its status as a buzzword, uh, I'm imagining, uh, as can happen with buzzwords, a lot of people, uh, maybe developers, I know there's a lot of developers here, uh, have heard about it, uh, but don't maybe don't have a super firm grasp on exactly what it is. Uh, but I've made a lot of assumptions about my audience here. Uh, so I'd like to do a little on-the-spot human-centered design and get to know you all better so I can cater what we're going to talk about today to who you are. Uh, and this is nothing new. I've seen a lot of presenters do this, but it qualifies as uh, human-centered design. So I'd like to ask the room by a show of hands who here that works in the digital development space uh, is one of these roles. Uh, so show of hands, who here is a developer? A couple people. Uh, who here is a designer? More designers. Uh, who here is a project manager or similar? About the same number. Uh, who here is something else? A lot, a lot. Uh, I'd like to ask a couple. Uh, I'm a web managing editor. I run the day-to-day -day oh, yeah. operations. Of course, yeah. You? It's online. Data analyst. Data analyst. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and again, a uh, show of hands, uh, who here would say that you know what human-centered design is? few hands, a little timid. All right, awesome, that's perfect. Um, so, yeah, so I'll uh, try to use that to go into a little more detail in certain places. Um, and again, that's, you know, this is something I see presenters do a lot, uh, but it, it, it qualifies as human-centered design. Um, and so we're gonna start by talking about why that is, uh, by first defining what human-centered design is, and then we'll talk about how to do it. And then we're going to talk about why to do it, uh, why human-centered design is talked about so much in government right now, uh, how it makes our work better, and what the benefits are. Uh, so what is human-centered design? Uh, I think this happens uh, in a lot of our disciplines, but in digital design, there's a lot of terms you'll encounter uh, beyond just design, right? Uh, so you'll see terms like UX design, information architecture, service design, um, and on and on. Uh, so I, and I imagine a lot of other people, might kind of roll our eyes uh, when we hear a new one. And our first instinct might be uh, to dismiss it a little bit. Um, what kind of broke me from that mindset is realizing that these different types of design aren't, as they might sound at first, wholly distinct practices with their own rigid processes that have to be learned and followed. Um, they're really all just design, and there's a whole lot of overlap between them. Um, so what is the difference? Uh, as with a lot of design terms, uh, or maybe all of the terms, uh, there's some squishiness here. Human-centered design may end up being practiced very differently between government, which is the perspective we'll be looking at it from today, versus, say, designing for an app for a for-profit company. Um, but that squishiness only goes to a point, because the difference between these different types of design, the only like rigid, real difference, in my opinion, is the core focus of each. That focus can be different things. It can be on what you're designing, like in the case of information architecture, where you're focused on designing a site's content, functionality, and relationships. Um, or UI design, 
where you're focused on designing the site's interface. Or it can also be on what you're prioritizing when you design, like in customer experience design, where designers are prioritizing, like optimizing the customer journey before, during, and after they engage with your site. Um, so that brings us to the definition of human-centered design, which I understand to be the centering of the humans you're designing for in your design process. Um, and that's it. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, there's one small part of it that I want to unpack a little, and that's design process. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean a defined process being conducted by a designer. Um, design here just means that act of deciding what a site is going to be, what the pages are going to be, how the navigation is going to work, what was on the home page, all of it. Uh, that happens 100% of the time on every website, like ever, right? Um, which means that whether you know it or not, you have a design process. Whether you figured out your site as a designer, a project manager, or on the fly as a developer, you and your team have some design process you're following because at some point you've made those decisions. Um, and so that's it. Uh, the centering of the humans you're designing for in your design process. At the end of the day, we're all building things that exist for people to use. Um, if we build those things without some type of input from those people, we're only assuming that what we're going to build is going to be useful or make sense to them. Um, and that's a risk. So human-centered design is about bringing them, uh, bringing them in to arm ourselves with the knowledge that will help us lower that risk. In my opinion, if you're doing something that you could reasonably say falls under this definition, you can say you're doing human-centered design. And the more you're doing that meets this definition, the more human-centered your process is. Uh, provided, of course, that everything you're doing continues to be informative and useful. Uh, if you're not interacting with your audience at all, you're not really doing human-centered design. Um, there's some debate over that, but for our purposes here today, uh, that's, that's what we're going to be doing. Um, but what kind of things are we talking about here? Um, what kind of things might you be doing that could make it so that you could say you're doing human-centered design? Um, or really, how do you center the humans you're designing for in your design process? <coughs> so in doing human-centered design, the only limits are your imagination. Uh, anything you can think of that brings your audience into your design process will get you there. Um, a few examples are uh, observation, where you might watch someone navigate your website as a part of usability testing, or even watch them navigate situations in their real life that your site is meant to assist with or address. Um, that might sound a little crazy, but if you think about designing a site for new parents, for example, by observing them in real life, you might realize that you need to make your clickable areas bigger because they're rocking a crying child and it's harder for them to tap on their phones accurately. Uh, workshops. Uh, workshops are where you uh, structure a set of activities for a group of people to complete in order to discover their motivations or goals or anything else um, that might help inform what you design for them. Card sorting is a good example of this, where you present an unsorted pile of cards with words representing the content of your site and ask people to sort them into categories so that you can base the structure and navigation of your site on how they think about the content. The most extreme way to center your audience in your design process is, is by literally just doing it uh, and inviting them to be on your team. Uh, I was at an event a while ago and talking to a team who was developing a toolkit for assisting government organizations when reaching out to communities. Um, they found a community representative and made them a member of the team alongside their designers and project managers. But the way that this is most frequently done, at least by like government agencies that I've worked with and talked to that consider themselves to be practicing like capital H human-centered design, is audience interviews. So I'm going to focus on those a little more deeply, um, and this will be the bulk of what we talk about today. Interviews are just what they sound like. They're just talking to your audience. Uh, the purpose of interviews is to ask the questions that will get you the answers you need to know in order to design a site that will meet their needs and be easy for them to use. Um, it sounds simple, but there are a lot of common pitfalls that I see even like very experienced designers fall into when conducting interviews. 
So uh, we're going to go over some helpful tips for conducting audience interviews. Um, and all those, although these tips can be applied to all of the different human-centered activities that we have talked about. <coughs> uh, but first, a quick heads up. Uh, I think this is the most important thing I'm going to say today. Um, if you only take one thing away from this session, uh, it, it should be this, I think. Um, whether you're a designer or not, whether you're, whenever you're building something, talk to your audience. Um, do it to whatever extent that you can, um, and in whatever form that you can. And when you do it, uh, this is some really good stuff to keep in mind. Uh, when writing your interview, um, like obviously uh, an interview is comprised of questions, and you need to write those questions. Uh, what your questions are will vary wildly depending on what you're trying to achieve and who your audience is, a whole lot of factors. Um, but here's some tips for writing them. Uh, these first two points I'm going to quickly review, and then I'm going to give an example to illustrate. Uh, uh, first is don't ask leading questions. It's very easy to accidentally lead your audience to a certain answer by asking them a certain question or asking a question in a specific way. Not doing this takes a little bit of additional effort. Um, ask about real scenarios, not simple tasks. Um, it's very common to design a test around whether something is like findable or usable. Um, but that's really only going to give you very surface level information that may be missing deeper problems. Um, so here's uh, an example to illustrate those two things. Let's say you're working on a site that provides resources for emergency preparedness, like earthquakes and heat waves. You might want to make sure that people can find their resources link on the homepage, because obviously that's your <clears throat> most important page, right? Um, your first instinct might be to show people the homepage and ask them, where would you go to find resources to help you with the heat wave? This is an example of a pretty leading question because the user is simply going to scan the page for the word resources, and they're definitely going to find it, and you won't really have learned anything. Um, and, you know, that might sound a little exaggerated, but this is the type of thing that I see on uh, uh, interviews and tests all the time. Um, so how can we do better? Uh, a better way to find out if the site is effective would be to show them the home page and give them a real scenario. Like, if you saw on the news that a heat wave was coming tomorrow and you wanted to get bottled water from your community center, what would you do? Uh, what if people went to the contact page to try and find the phone number for their community center? Asking people if they could find the resources link would not have shown you that. An even better thing to do would be to ask that same question but strip out a lot of the details and not even show them the home page. If you saw in the news that a heat wave was coming tomorrow, what would you do? Uh, this eliminates a lot of assumptions and tells you what they would do in real life, which is the thing that we're designing for. Um, and if you hear that people would email their city councilor about where to get water, that they would go to the library to keep cool because it has great air conditioning, um, but no one says, I would go to the site, you might realize that uh, your biggest problem is that no one has heard of the same. Um, then you can get a plan in place to meet people at those points of contact they described and let them know about everything the site has to offer. You get in touch with the city councilor's office to let them know to refer people to the site, leave flyers at libraries, whatever. Um, and uh, But I don't want to give project managers or anyone a heart attack, um, so I want to add, after asking that question, you can still show them the site and get feedback on it. Um, in fact, I would definitely recommend doing that, obviously. Um, the site still needs to work well, and we all have backlogs to fill, I realize. Um, all right, so you've written your interviews, uh, or you at least have enough of a handle on them that you're comfortable starting to schedule them. Uh, here's some things to keep in mind when planning your interviews. Uh, first, lower the barrier for entry. Uh, make it easy for people to schedule with you, and don't make them jump through hoops, uh, because by not doing that, you're putting undue burden on people, which is something government is talking about battling these days. Um, and you're also narrowing the type of people you're going to hear back from. Uh, I recently signed up as a participant for an audience interview in my home city, um, I always like to spy on other designers whenever I get the chance. I'm very nosy. Um, and there were a couple things they did that made me worry that they were going to lose some people. Um, 
first they ask me to just like send my vote. Um, I was then asking myself like for when, like today, tomorrow, <laughs> next week. Um, and second, they asked me to fill out two PDF documents and email them back to them, uh, which that alone would be tough enough for some people, but one of them was a, a W-9 that I uh, was supposed to enter my social security number into. Um, so they kind of narrowed who they're going to hear back from to people who, like, one, are going to sit there and type out whatever availability they think they're being asked for. Uh, two, have the technical proficiency to fill out a PDF and attach it to an email reply. So uh, boomers are out, except for uh, the ones in this room, of course. <laughs> um, and three, are very lax when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, instead, you can do things like send a Calendly link, um, or if you're worried your audience isn't tech savvy enough for that, you can give them some times to pick from, or at least a timeline. Uh, you can build a form online for them to fill out instead of a PDF uh, and design your interview uh, in a way that doesn't require them to fill out government paperwork uh, in order to participate. Um, mine was asking for a W-9 because they wanted to mail me a check for my time, which is very nice and considerate, but maybe they wouldn't have to do that with like gift cards or something else. Um, so you need to think about everything you're sending your audience's way and consider whether it could be easier or better for them. Um, next is, and that kind of leads into my next point, which is uh, do the work to hear from everyone. Um, not literally everyone, obviously, but you want to be doing everything you can to be hearing from all the different types of people in your audience uh, that there are. Um, and before you get to that point, you have to figure out what all those different types are. Um, and you don't have to launch uh, like a research study to do this. Uh, there should uh, hopefully be someone in the government agency you're working at or with that has a pretty good sense of it already who you can just talk to. Um, then once you've got a sense of the different groups, you uh, would do well to intentionally reach out to them. Um, if you just blast out some social media posts or emails from people that have signed up to hear from you, you're only going to hear from a specific type of pretty technologically engaged uh, uh, person. Um, so in addition to that, maybe you can kind of like I was talking about before, like reach out to some libraries or schools, whoever, um, ask how, and ask how you might get the word out. They might be able to do some announcements at classes or events or might have uh, uh, some places where you can hang up an announcement. Um, maybe there are community events that you can attend for recruitment. Uh, this is another spot where the only limit is your imagination. Um, and I know this sounds like it could be a lot, and it can, um, but we need to do as well as we can with this because, like, especially in government, we have to strive to meet the needs of everyone, um, not just most people or even just 90% of people. Um, and to do that, we have to know what everyone needs and how to get it to them, and to know that, uh, the best way is to just talk to them. Um, that said, as with everything, be realistic. If you're just an like, ambitious and heroic developer trying to sneak some of this work in as best you can, uh, don't give up if you can't do a recruitment table at an event. Uh, maybe for this effort, you just have a couple conversations about who the different types of uh, audiences are and uh, interview some people that you know. Um, a, a little something is so much better than nothing. Um, and maybe you'll get to do more next time. Um, and then uh, be prepared for it to get complicated. Um, we're talking about people here, and people are complicated. Um, and people are complicated in like unique ways. So if we're centering these complicated things in our process, our process can become complicated in ways that are hard to predict. Um, we recently did some audience interviews for a service that provides transportation to people that need it to get to medical these people were often elderly, and in addition to not having their own sources of transportation, uh, they often have difficulty communicating and scheduling reliably. Our first attempt at conducting a round of interviews with them resulted in a lot of no-shows. Uh, too many for us to be able to say that we had heard enough and move on. Um, so we went in for a second round and adjusted our approach. We booked far more interviews. Um, like over double the amount we were trying to conduct. Uh, we stayed closer in touch, proactively checking in a couple times ahead of the interview, and we also put a higher priority on communicating with people warmly and with compassion. 
Um, so they knew we would be listening and would care about what they had to say and would hopefully see the value in attending. Um, and gaining people's trust in that way is a huge help in getting them invested in talking to you and getting them to open up uh, to you so they can give you the real answers that you're looking for. If they see you as like some clipboard and tie, uh, they might infer that their answers aren't going to have that much of an impact, and they might not be willing to put much effort into the interview. If they see you as someone who cares about them and everyone like them, they'll have more confidence their answers will have an impact, so they'll be more motivated to give them to you. Um, I'm not saying fake it. Definitely do not do that. Um, if you are engaging in human-centered design, then my assumption is that you really do care about the people at All right. So, what the heck was I talking about? Um, yeah. Yes. And so, uh, an additional complication for the project I was just discussing was hearing some pretty tough stuff. Uh, this service engages with a very vulnerable population that's lacking resources, and unfortunately, some of them had uh, some not great experiences with it in the past. Um, uh, and some of the people that we were talking to like needed to tell us about it. Um, and that brings us to our next section. Uh, conducting your interviews. So you've written and scheduled your interviews. Now it's time to conduct them. Um, first thing you want to keep in mind for that is to really listen. Uh, be prepared to hear and follow up on anything, even if it's unexpected, um, and really especially if it's unexpected. A big reason to conduct these interviews is to make sure we're not missing anything big. If we find out about a much bigger problem than the ones we're conducting our research around, uh, it would behoove us to treat it accordingly. Um, again, I don't want to give any project managers heart attacks. Uh, we don't have to throw out a roadmap and start from scratch on Monday. Um, but the next time we're prioritizing work, uh, we should take what we learned into account. Um, or if it is important enough, you know, maybe we do uh, re-strategize a little more quickly. Um, really listen also means giving people the space to say whatever they have to say. Uh, it's easy when you're conducting interviews to get in the mindset of gathering up answers to like your preset questions, feeling like you got what you needed and moving on. Um, but again, we're conducting these interviews to learn about the unknown. So we might not have even known what questions to ask. Um, something I say about interviews a lot is that you can work hard to come up with like just the right questions, um, and you absolutely should. Um, but often people are going to say whatever they need to say uh, anyway. Um, or at least some of them will, for the ones that won't make some space for them to say uh, whatever they need to say by not rushing through the interview um, and having a completely open-ended question or two. Uh, the best and easiest thing to do is, at the end of the interview, just ask them if there's anything else they'd like to say. Um, and whenever they're talking, if it's not something that's on your form, don't zone out, don't just smile and nod, listen to what they're saying, and think about how it impacts your project. And if they're looking for help with something, whether it's relevant to your project or not, Think about how you can help them, uh, what office you can refer them to, what phone number you can give them, or who you can put them in touch with. Um, and if you don't have those answers on the spot, you can look them up later and just send them in a quick follow-up. Uh, this is human-centered design, so we should live that and never lose track of the fact that the people we're talking to are people. Um, and last, for conducting your interview, um, I don't know, we've got a couple more. Uh, do it live. I always recommend that people do live interviews. Uh, asynchronous approaches like unmoderated user testing, where you watch a video of people using the site, or surveys are good. Uh, they work, and they're much better than nothing if those are your options. But the, the main reason to talk to people live, if you can, is that it's the only way you can ask people to clarify what they're saying, and it's the only way to, that you can ask them why they think something or did something. So if somebody says something and you just don't understand what they said, or if they say or do something that really surprises you, um, you can ask a video about it until you're blue in the face, uh, but only a person can answer. Not being able to ask these types of questions is risky. It might cause you to miss some important information. So uh, like in my example earlier, if someone is tasked with preparing for a heat wave and they click on the contact button, you're really going to want to ask them why they did that. 
and when they say to get water, you're going to want to ask them why they clicked contact to get water. And then you're going to find out they were trying to contact their local community center. Um, and ask follow-up questions. This is a bit of a retread of listen and do it live, but it bears highlighting. Uh, ask follow-up questions. Don't just record the initial answer to your preset questions and move on. You're here to learn about people, and you need to be curious. If you see or hear anything you think is interesting or don't understand, you just ask people. So, uh, how do I interview people for human-centered design? This is just a little summary of everything we talked about. Uh, make it easy, talk to everyone you can, uh, be prepared for it to get complicated, really listen, talk to them live, ask a lot of follow-up questions, and don't lead them to an answer. Uh, ask them about their real lives. So you've successfully conducted your interviews, uh, and you now have a good foundation of knowledge about who your audience is, what they need, and how to get it to them to build your work on. Uh, what does that look like? Um, this is another point where the only limit is your imagination. Um, and this is a part of the process that can often feel like a bit of a black box to me. Um, how do you take this giant pile of knowledge and turn it into like a wireframe or a site structure and navigation? Uh, the path or process that you take to get there can vary wildly depending on a lot of factors. Um, if you're an experienced designer starting a new, a new site from scratch in like a risk-averse environment, as is often the case in government, right? Um, you might have a pretty detailed process uh, that involves uh, identifying themes and patterns from your interviews, which inform your user journeys, then using both of those to draft a content model and flows that will inform the structure and navigation of your site, uh, and what content might go on each page. But if you're a new designer, or a non-designer in a small, tight-knit team adapting human-centered design, um, you might conduct your interviews, review and internalize them together, and jump straight to mock-ups, or even develop um, And that's okay. Uh, again, doing a little is much better than doing nothing. In either case, you want to make sure that you are incorporating what you learned into what you're designing or building. Um, you want to be letting it decide uh, what to build or at least whatever pieces of what you're building uh, people have anything to say about, and referring back to it whenever you can to support your decisions. Um, this might sound like extra work, uh, but it's not really. Um, if you were really listening to what people were saying, you just um, know it now. Um, and so as you're figuring out what the site navigation should be, um, you'll remember the vocabulary people use to talk about things on the site, or what terminology confused them and you'll know what words to use or avoid, so it'll uh, make more sense to you. And the more you do this and discuss it with your team, the more of a human-centered centered culture you'll build. Um, I think a good way to get a better idea of how to use what you learn from something, like an interview or a workshop, is to uh, talk about the few times we've done it and how it went. So I'm gonna go over three examples. Um, uh, we were working with, uh, the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts on a site redesign. They've been getting a lot of complaints from their site authors about the authoring experience on the site. Um, so we wanted to address that. Um, uh, we decided to conduct a survey with them. Uh, in this scenario, you know, we were confident that they would be able to express themselves really well, and we knew we could reach out to anyone if we had further questions about their answers. Um, so in that survey, we asked them about which features of the editing experience they use and what the most useful and difficult parts of editing content were. Uh, we were able to use their answers uh, to determine which features we could drop or enhance and what new features we needed. Um, one thing we heard was that uh, they weren't like seeing stuff in their search results and also they didn't know what they were looking at when they looked at their search results. So we. Um, made the search uh, check more fields in the content uh, for the search term, and also included some um, more contextual information, like what content type it was and stuff like that. Um, we also asked them to uh, rate the current authoring experience overall, so we could ask them to do that again a while after the relaunch and see if that score improved. Uh, we also use human-centered design internally. Uh, we were recently planning an internal company day uh, where we would bring everyone at last call together to keep people informed about the company and help them feel like more of a part of it. 
Um, but when we sat down to create the agenda, we were like, oh man, like what would do that? Um, and we just decided to just ask people, like no better way to answer that question, right? Um, so we conducted an internal survey asking everyone what they wanted to hear about the company, what kinds of topics or activities they thought would be most valuable. I took those answers into Miro where I uh, just made this really simple system to make a post-it note for everything someone mentioned and as I went through the rest of the answers every time that thing was mentioned again I just moved it up the ladder and at the end we knew what uh, people as a group were most interested in and what they weren't and then we just literally made that the agenda for our company. Uh, we just did what everyone told us they wanted. Um, and then we did a follow-up survey and people uh, really overwhelmingly said that they were satisfied with the event and felt more connected to the company. So um, it seemed like it worked. Um, another thing uh, I want to talk about is a concept that you see around a lot in government that's kind of a part of the human-centered design wave. Uh, and that's life event hubs, uh, a hub being a central page you can use to navigate to and from a collection of related pages. So a lot of earlier government sites used to be organized by agency or department. Um, and if so if you like needed a new driver's license, you uh, uh, would find the section of the website for the DMV. Um, and you know that kind of makes sense. That's kind of how it works in real life, and that was an existing structure that, that we could base things on. Um, but uh, there are like less obvious examples where it's like, is it immediately obvious that SNAP benefits are offered by the Department of Human Services? Like it's you know not to me. Um, so then a number of years back, a more intuitive solution became popular, which is organizing your site by service. So you know if you need to renew your license, there's the renew a license page. If you're looking to enroll in SNAP, here's the SNAP page. Um, and those services would be collected by like theme, uh, like driving and assistance programs. Um, and that's much better. But the problem there comes when you think about the fact that people may not even know what they need or what is available to them. Uh, so like if I'm moving into an apartment in the city, how do I know that I can get a permit um, to block off some spaces for the moving truck? Um, so something I'm seeing governments do is these uh, life event hubs. Um, people don't know what licenses and permits they need, but they do know what life event they're currently navigating. Um, so this is a page on boston.gov about moving. So people moving in Boston don't need to somehow already know that they can get a parking permit for their moving truck, because this page tells them. And it tells them uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, how to update your mailing address, address with USPS, uh, when the trash gets picked up, how to get rid of your old couch, uh, it's all there. And all they really need to know is that they're moving in Massachusetts. So uh, now that we have a good sense, uh, I hope, of what human-centered design is and how to do it, we're going to talk about actually doing it. Um, or no, I'm sorry. We're going to talk about, uh, uh, if we're going to talk about actually doing it, um, it's important to consider and have a good handle on why we um, and to start, I want to talk about something that came out a while ago that is telling us to do it. Um, in late 2021, the president issued the, uh, deep breath, uh, executive order on transforming federal customer experience and service delivery to rebuild trust in government. Um, another show of hands, who here is familiar with this executive order? A few people. Um, uh, so we're going to take a look at the first paragraph here. Um, and as we look at this, a lot of this should be sounding pretty familiar by now. Um, focus on the actual experiences of people and direct lines of feedback for engaging people. Um, that's all right there in the opening paragraph of this executive order. Um, and later it says, the federal government's management of its customer experience and service delivery should be driven fundamentally by the voice of the customer through human-centered design methodologies. And later it gives its own definition of human-centered design as an interdisciplinary method of putting people, including those who will use or be impacted by what one creates at the center of any process to solve challenging problems. Um, and this isn't just about improving websites, it extends to the uh, designing of the services themselves and any way the public interfaces with the government. It talks about reducing the amount of paperwork people have to do, the wait times they experience for services, 
So the different agencies should work together instead of making people go to each of them for a single task. Um, and it says to simplify the processes, uh, not only for people, but the administrative processes. Um, at government events I've attended lately, this seems to have had an impact. Uh, at Code for America in DC this year, uh, many of the sessions that I went to were talking about this stuff. Um, and also at uh, the Massachusetts Digital Summit, um, the Secretary of EOTS, the Executive Office of Technology Services and Security, uh, stated that it's his office's top priority. Um, so why? Has this all been set into motion? Um, there's some great benefits that come from uh, human-centered design. Uh, right in the title of the executive order, it says to rebuild trust in government. Um, we're being told uh, that we're to do human-centered design to rebuild trust in government. Um, but how does it do that? Uh, the executive order says by demonstrating that its processes are effective and efficient, in addition to being fair, protective of privacy interests, and transparent, the government can build public trust. And that's great uh, for the government. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about some of the reasons uh, the people in this room and the people we might have to convince should want to do human-centered design. Um, what's the goal of the work we're doing? Uh, in government, our goal at the highest level is to benefit people, uh, for the people, right? Uh, so if our goal is to help people, then we're doing a better job by being more helpful, and we know how to help people by talking to them. And at the end of the day, the things we build are meant to be used by people. Um, so if they work better for people, we've done a better job. And if those things are true, then human-centered design is helping us do a better job. Um, and here are some great things that can happen when we're doing a better job with this stuff. Uh, higher satisfaction, trust, and loyalty from users. Um, when things work well, people are happy, and they will trust you more, and they will come back to you anytime that you can help them. Um, this is the how and the why for the government wanting us to use human-centered design to build trust. Uh, more certainty and less risk in our projects. So if through practicing human-centered design and talking to people, we're making things that work better, uh, we're going to be able to proceed with our work more confidently, and we're decreasing the chances that, say, during like pre-launch user testing, we're going to find out some massive usability problem we need to scramble uh, uh, and find resources and a timeline to address. A happier and more rewarding job. I really like how the executive order talks about reducing administrative burdens. If we're really being human-centered, uh, we're talking about everyone, not just end users, but all of our colleagues and ourselves as well. Um, so it's worth noting that when people are happy with what you've built and you're spending less time fixing things that don't work, it creates a better work environment, which of course is helpful for getting great candidates and increasing retention. And uh, finally, everyone looks good, right? Uh, when the things you build are used and liked by your users, you've quantifiably done a good job, um, and that makes you look good. Um, and not to mention like the executive order telling us to do human-centered design has provided us with a straightforward way to be able to say, it's my job to be doing this, and to convince stakeholders and higher-ups that they will look good, and that they are like forward-thinking leaders in step with the highest levels of government by doing it. Um, and just as like a quick heads up, if you hear things like customer experience design or modernization, that's probably a good environment to start a human-centered design initiative. Um, so, whew, uh, we did it, everybody. Uh, running a little behind, hurried, hurried toward the end there a little bit. Um, but yeah, so we now know what human-centered design is and how to do it um, and why to do it. Uh, here's a summary of everything we talked about today, um, but just to reiterate that final point, you know, uh, whenever you're building something, talk to the people you're building it for, uh, to whatever extent you can, and a little bit is so much better than nothing. Um, and if any of you, as a result of today, end up in the future talking to your audience as a part of your project, this session will have been a huge success. Um, and if you ever have any questions about doing that, uh, please drop me a line. Um, there's my contact info, brief feedback form. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Great.